Hi, in this video, I will give a quick update on initial dry stone run on the RISC-V RV32IC I built before. I will be focusing on the procedure I used to make dry stone program run on my tiny system, and also a few suggestions on improvements I could potentially make to have better dry stone numbers later on. The RISC-V design is pretty much what I had before, except I added a time counter just for convenience. This is a list of items I needed to have my dry stone program run. I do need to do some minor edits on the source code to avoid some problems I had. I have this page just to keep track of what source code I changed. You may not need them as your system will be different. After some debugging effort, the drystone program did run OK on my system, and here's a sample output of one drystone run. I did need to put some delay on the display routine so I can see what's scrolling through the screen. Now, the drystone MIPS is the drystone per second number divided by 1757, and we get a number around 30 for this one. Now we get the first row entry of this table. The overall DMIPS number is pretty low. I will not try to improve it instantly, but would investigate what could be improved. There are three areas I can quickly think of to improve the dry stone number. First is the memory access cycle. Second is to improve the prefetch buffer. And third would be to add pipelines. For the first two, I will do some sort of quick evaluations here. For the third item on pipelining, I will not elaborate much at this time. Currently, I have decode and execution done in one single cycle for most instructions. For load and store, extra memory cycles are needed. Other than that, I don't have any pipeline in place right now. Currently, I'm using FPGA internal memory for system ROM and RAM implementation. For Cyclone FPGA series, the internal memory access is two cycle. Here's a snapshot from the IP Builder tool. Conceptually, there's always a flip flop at the address or control input. So you can think of the access a two phase operation. The first phase is address or control phase, and the second phase is the data phase. There could be two options to get around this, sort of. The first option is to have the memory clock twice the processor clock. The second option is to keep both memory and processor clocks the same frequency, but one phase shifted or inverted of the other. For a quick evaluation, I chose option two. However, during the implementation, I ran into some timing problems. Instead of tweaking the timing constraints and also possibly modifying some RTO structure, I just lower the processor clock from 50 MHz to 20 MHz. So here are the dry stone numbers. Processor clock is changed from 50 MHz to 20 MHz. The memory access is still kept two cycles. The DMIPS number is lower, but the per MHz DMIPS stays the same. After memory access is changed from two cycles to one cycle, I got over 50% improvement on the dry stone number. This potential improvement would affect all program executions as the general memory access is improved. And for the prefetch buffer evaluation, instead of adding features to it, I just did one line of RDO code change to make the prefetch buffer length from four word entry to two word entry. It will still function to convert four byte instruction fetch stream to either four byte or two byte instruction decoding and then execution. There's probably not much buffering now with just two word entries. Now I'm getting pretty big degradation on dry stone numbers when I reduce the prefetch buffer length to 2. This number could change from programs to programs as the optimal prefetch buffer length could vary. But the overall idea is we want to make the memory access fast. And we want to somehow buffer instruction and memory load and store streams efficiently so they don't get into each other's way and slow down the program execution. 
But looking at these numbers, I was wondering if I could improve the dry zone numbers by increasing the prefetch buffer length. So I went ahead and made the design change to increase the prefetch buffer length to 8. The dry stone numbers did not get better. In this case, forward entry looked good enough. Instead of increasing buffer length, doing some branch prediction may be another way. Now that I'm done with the evaluation, I will still come back and use 50 MHz clock and 2 cycle memory access for now. Before closing this evaluation, I do have a few words on the pipelining. I did put in some effort to implement a three-stage pipeline in hope to put the processor clock frequency back to 50 MHz during one cycle memory access. I did have some timing improvement, but not as much as I had hoped for. For three-stage pipeline, as I tried not to put in a bubble or store the pipeline when there is a resource conflict, I added some additional bypass as in this graph. So that makes the timing worse. There are certainly more advantages you can have to have pipeline, but this is the most reason I want to experiment this at this time. I will stop at this stage right now, but will come back later to do better planning on the pipeline beforehand. During this evaluation, I've found that I'm very close to switching to a bigger FPGA board. The utilization seems fine now, but I need a lot of internal memory for the built-in FPGA logic analyzer tool for debugging. Maybe I'll know better in my next update. Until then, thanks for watching.